You're listening to the Futures Podcast with me, Luke Robert Mason. On this episode, I speak to philosopher and psychoanalytic theorist Isabel Miller. Humans are very complicated things and very delicate things and very powerful things, and we need to understand them before we can understand how AI will interact with them. Isabel explained the role psychoanalysis can play in helping us to understand what artificial intelligence means for humanity, what modern science fiction reveals about our fascination with sex robots, and what is driving a desire to replicate human attributes in silicon. So, Isabel, your new book, The Psychoanalysis of Artificial Intelligence, is a provocative text that looks at AI through a psychoanalytical lens. So, what is the relationship between AI and psychoanalysis, and why have you decided to take this approach? So, the the, the question of the psychoanalysis of AI came about through various different journeys into thinking about what AI meant for us as speaking sexed subjects. And when I say speaking sex subjects, of course, as a psychoanalytic thinker, the sort of fundamental question that we are always thinking about is the question of speech and the question of sexuality. These are sort of subjects which cross over within the history of philosophy and which also sort of define the crux between the, the paradigms of psychoanalysis and philosophy in the way that they think about being writ large or consciousness or what the, what subjectivity means. So what I was really interested in was trying to think about how we can take the question of subjectivity and the question of artificial intelligence and think about that through a psychoanalytic perspective, as opposed to what, from my perspective, has been previously the approach, which has always been a philosophical one Mm -hmm. and one which sort of attempts to think about this sort of uh, self-present thinking, being conscious subject in relation to this big monolithic question of AI. So as you can see, there are already a million different things going on there. It was really a question of trying to find a way in to to putting the two disciplines into conversation with each other. Well, it's it's certainly a provocative title, and it was the reason that I wanted to have you on this podcast. And when I first read it, I thought, what is Isabel doing here? Is she attempting to take algorithms to therapy? Are, Are we planning to psychoanalyze AI? And if so, what would that really mean? Or in some cases, are you considering the AI to become a psychoanalyst? I mean, what were some of the playful ways in which you were trying to introduce psychoanalytical theory to AI? So, I mean, I think, first of all, the sort of task is to establish what I'm talking about when I'm talking about psychoanalysis. Yeah. And, you know, first of all, I'll say I'm a theorist and a philosopher, and I'm not a psychoanalyst in the sense I don't have a clinic, I don't practice clinical psychoanalysis, but I have trained within the arena of clinical psychoanalysis, and it's very much part and parcel of the theory that I invoke in the book. And, you know, I'll just stay out front. I'm a Lacanian. Um, my psychoanalysis is from the, the, the Lacanian heritage, as it were. But, but I'm sure anyone who knows anything about Lacan will, will immediately know that this is a figure, an intellectual figure who kind of crosses over the uh, sort of huge um, section of intellectual history that is both in philosophy and in psychoanalysis and social theory and political theory. Mm-hmm. And he's, for a lot of people, a controversial figure. Or, and for other people, he's the only psychoanalyst that exists. And of course, I would side with the, the, the latter because he's somebody who truly contributes something extremely subversive and radical to the thinking of the psychoanalytic subject. And he's somebody who really questions the place of psychoanalysis within the sciences and within philosophy itself. Mm-hmm. So it's because of his rigor and radical approach to the question of, psycho- of the psychoanalytic subject that to me he was the sort of ideal thinker to think with for this question. And you know immediately the question of artificial intelligence it makes you think of oh well what are you talking about when you're talking about intelligence? Mm. And it's very much this problematization of the question of intelligence which is at the heart of psychoanalytic thinking itself. So this is one of the first things that I try to engage with in the book is to, to unpack this question. What is intelligence? What do we mean when we're talking about intelligence? 
Well, let's spend some time unpacking that idea of intelligence because you focus less on the artifice of artificial intelligence and more on that key term, intelligence, because the only way we currently are able to understand what intelligence is, is through the lens of human subjectivity and our own understanding of human intelligence. So Mm -hmm. how is a radical understanding of the human key to understanding how something like AI might actually develop? Well, first of all, if we just take this concept of intelligence, Mm -hmm. we'll very quickly see that it's a problematic concept itself, which entails within it a a whole sort of genealogy of political, scientific, social shifts in the ways that we understood intelligence and the way that we have instrumentalized intelligence. Mm -hmm. So first of all, first thing to say is intelligence is not just a scientific category. It's almost not even a scientific category. It's a philosophical category. And it's one which has been at the heart of philosophical thinking for, you know, centuries, for millennia. You know, we can think of the distinction between episteme and techne that Plato refers to in the Mino, that Lacan refers to in Seminar 17, the distinction between theoretical knowledge and practical know-how. And in fact, one of the ways that Lacan would at first engage with the question of um, knowledge is to very much sort of following on from Alexandre Kojev is to sort of draw attention to this extraction of knowledge from the master, from the slave Mm. by the master. So he he thinks of the sort of the little slave boy in the Mino as the boy drawing symbols on the sand, um, which are actually uh, extracted by the master for the use of Euclidean geometry to to create a school of theoretical knowledge, which the slave himself doesn't know he has, but he's extracted via the master in order to put to use. Uh, so he uses this very much as a paradigm of the extraction of technical knowledge into epistemic knowledge. And, and we can, of course, see how you can take that sort of quite basic sort of philosophical idea, even though it seems basic, but it's an idea that a lot of people forget. Mm. It's actually at the heart of lots of the ways that we think about artificial intelligence and the distinctions between, for example, sensory knowledge, haptic knowledge, unconscious knowledge, you know, all these different ways that we think about what intelligence is. So all of those different types of knowledge are already within this question of intelligence before we even start the question of AI. And I would be very surprised if there are many AI people out there who would even have known that distinction between episteme and technique. Maybe there are. But of course, it's like these traditions already exist within philosophy, but they're often not applied to, for example, the creation of algorithms. So you see that there's such a gulf between these two fields, and yet they should be talking to each other because they have a lot to learn, you know. Well, you say provocatively again in the book that there's almost something stupid about the way in which we currently think and talk about intelligence. So what is stupid about intelligence? Well, the stupid element of intelligence is sort of the heart of psychoanalysis in a way, because psychoanalysis sort of acknowledges the fact that our own blind spot is very much subjectivity itself. We can't really ever know ourselves. We can't ever grasp mm. all the knowledge that we have because we are our own void. You know, we, we occupy a, a nothingness and we have to sort of cast out into the world some sense of identity by virtue of language. So as soon as we've said, I am this person who is doing this, we've already detached ourselves from the I which speaks. Mm. So, you know, Lacan famously plays on uh, Descartes' cogito as the, the I think, therefore I am, and says, well, no, it's not I think, therefore I am. It's there is thinking, therefore something exists. Mm. But this is not the I. You know, this the I is in language. The I exists in language. And there's something behind that, which is a nothingness, and which is a sort of negativity that will always persist. And it's this negativity that persists, which is also in scientific discourse, which is what he was very interested in, is which is what is this negativity which persists within scientific discourse, but which is uh, foreclosed to science itself. And I guess in, in that case, that negativity that you're, you're talking about there, the ability to acknowledge that there is thinking is, is what we're trying to do when we recognise something we consider to be artificially intelligent. We're almost obsessed with the thinking piece, but as you prove in your book, Isabel, there's so much more to who we are, what we are, and what artificial intelligence could be than just merely thought. Exactly. For my book, you know, the the central concept, which of course emerges as the the key question that I'm trying to ask is not can it think, which is a sort of philosophical question Mm. about AI, but does it enjoy? And, you know, for psychoanalysis, enjoyment or 
to use, you know, Lacan's term jouissance, is this sort of paradoxical combination of pleasure and pain, but more fundamentally, it is a mode of enjoyment or it's a mode of existence and it's it's what all human beings suffer from. And when I say suffer, I mean that in the hmm. sort of existential sense of that is what it is to be a human, is that this, we all operate according to some sort of mode of jouissance, some sort of mode of pleasurable suffering. And, you know, it's really this question, which is at the heart of, of subjectivity, which is the heart of being, which is the heart of consciousness, which you you can't really get to just by sort of scientific ways of trying to understand artificial intelligence. You can't really understand consciousness and all these sort of very delineated ideas of what an individual subject is without thinking about the question of enjoyment and sex. Mm. And, you know, of course, for, for psychoanalysis, when I say sex, uh, I don't mean necessarily actual sex. I mean sex as a mm. philosophical concept and a philosophical problem. And when I say problem, that doesn't have a solution. You know, that's that's what makes it philosophical. There is no answer to it. It's an impasse. It's a it's a existential quandary for all humans. Uh, so it's this sort of nugget of the sexual question of it, which sits at the heart of the book, I should say. Yeah. Well, well, it certainly does feel like there's something procreative about the way in which we currently talk about artificial intelligence. We're creating these entities, often in the image and likeness of us. And because we perceive that the future of this stuff will look uh, in some way like us, we project our fears onto AI, mm -hmm. onto robots. We project these paranoid fears about how we're going to end up in this horrific future where AI will treat us as you said previously there as these slaves almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think the way in which we envision artificial intelligence is really just a presentation of our own human psyche? I think part of the interesting thing about AI is that it does, the sort of discourses surrounding AI have a, a lot of confusion around what really exists out there and what is mm. a product of fantasy and science yeah. fiction and cinema and, <laughs> and literature. And, you know, people kind of get all those things confused. But having said that, you know, that's actually makes sense because part of the way of producing these actual products of AI are products of fantasy, they are products of mm. fiction. And that's also kind of key, I suppose, in my thinking about the book is that sort of history of scientific paradigms around, you know, leading up to the, the creation of AI are also built on metaphysical bases, which themselves are influenced by different historical, social, political factors. And of course, they manifest themselves in the way that we think and talk about AI. And at the moment, for example, very obvious ones we can think of is the very sort of phallic masculine manifestations that we have exemplified in the sort of trifecta of Elon Musk and hmm. Kurzweil and and um, the metaverse, for example. You know, all of these very um, masculinist, perhaps I could say, visions of what this sort of brave new future of striding forth into this amazing universe will be, which are very naive. You know, they're very naive and they're very unnuanced about what actually human beings are. Hearing you talk about individuals like uh, Musk and Kurzweil there, I mean, they have become the sort of faces for this potential AI future. In Kurzweil's case, it's this possibility of uploading our minds and computers. In Musk's case, it's this fear of AI, and yet he has his own ambitions to create this thing called Tesla AI, which will be, again, a some form of humanoid robot. And that's the promise that was was shown to the public a couple of months ago. But mm -hmm. in being so dogmatic about these singular visions for what AI might be, how it might present itself, or how it might look, what are they missing? What is not being discussed about AI? Yeah, I mean, they're missing a lot. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, the kind of um, the, the sort of common criticism, which it should be uh, the main criticism, is of course the sort of political and social question of power, mm. you know, of the fact that these people are people with enormous amounts of power, enormous amounts of money and influence, and they are interested in keeping that money and keeping that influence and lots of interested mm. people who are around them. And of course, it can't be without danger. It can't be without exploitation, it can't be without prejudice. And um, all of the critiques that surround that are um, very important. We need to to keep doing those critiques. But also, it's not just the sort of critique of capitalism, for example, which I'm interested in. It's also the, the critique of, like I say, you know, looking at the ways in which 
the concept of, of AI is one which is really neglected and it's not properly thought about in relation to what we think about when we think about a, a embodied consciousness or a, or a form of thought that isn't human. Mm. And I think that what happens is, you know, because we have the sort of fantasy of the, the 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 idea of the gestalt of a of a thinking thing outside in a body that you know these sort of fantasies of cyborgs and sex robots and stuff like this. But actually, the question is, what types of thought are going on already that aren't embodied, that aren't within recognizable forms of humanoid or recognizable types of non-human intelligence that we can say, oh, look, the robots are coming. Well, no, there, there are lots of other more subtle ways that this is happening that influence all of the ways that we interact with each other and all of our very kind of micro processes that we go through in becoming subjects because artificial intelligence is doing work for us that we don't even know you know so we're already immersed in, in such sort of insidious networks we probably don't even know what forms of thinking are happening that we don't necessarily recognize as as human th- types of thinking because we still don't recognize how human thinking works anyway we still don't understand i should say we still don't probably understand that so we we use very poor methods of trying to model computers on on humans when actually we've already what makes no sense is that we already started thinking to model the human mind on a computer and then we're trying to reverse that and do it the other way around, which doesn't make any sense because you're sort of reversing a metaphor back on, on itself when you were the one who invented the metaphor, if you see what I'm saying, which is what happens in cognitive science. That's what's interesting about your work is, is the difference between what psychoanalysis allows versus what cognitive science or psychology permits, yeah. let's say, just to help our audience understand what those differences are. Could you help explain how they look at the human in very differentiated ways? I suppose the difference between the psychoanalytic as opposed to the cognitive or psychologized way of thinking about the human mind is that there's no sort of normal human. There's no there, For psychoanalysis, it's not a question of a mind that you can model upon certain ideas of sanity or insanity and health and, and unhealth or prediction of, you know, well, if this person does this and it means that. Very, very basically, we can talk about, for example, in psychoanalysis, you know, we don't talk about trying to cure a symptom because a symptom by definition is a, is, a, is a clue towards something else. It's pointing you towards something else. So in cognitive science, for example, you're trying so oh, you've got you've got a phobia of this. Let me get rid of that phobia, and then you'll be fine because you don't you no longer do this. So it's a sort of very basic understanding of the sort of mechanistic process that people go through in just going about the world. But of course, it's normalising because there it's a tool of trying to fit people into a system, a system of work, mm. a system of capital, a system of society, which by definition is ideological. And you know, psychoanalysis. At its most radical is the complete opposite of that. What it what it wants to do is it's not make you better. It's not trying to cure you of anything. Yeah. It's allowing you to come to terms with the knowledge that you already have. And that knowledge comes through, you know, language and through discourse and through all of the things that have come together it to make you a human being. And you can't just uh, simplify that by reading some notes and to, to try and tick off, okay, is this person doing this right there? That sort of person. Here's your diagnosis. You're mm-hmm. um, an obsessive compulsive person who needs to, you know, for psychoanalysis, all you have is structure. You have a structure and, mm-hmm. which orients the analysis and via which means you find out exactly the singularity of that person's particular form of suffering. So it's very much more singular or not just singular, but it's much more free because you're not trying to assimilate somebody into society. Mm. So that's on that's a sort of very basic way of, of, of drawing attention to the, I suppose, the sort of clinical question of, of, of psychoanalysis and cognitive science, at least. I mean, it, it certainly feels like the trick is in the language there. We talk about human intelligence as if it was a singular thing. We talk about artificial intelligence as if it's going to express itself all in the same way. We don't talk about human intelligences or artificial intelligences. We just make these grand assumptions that these things will present in similar ways and therefore mm-hmm. can have a singular category. Yeah, exactly. And for for Lacan, he very much built on the Freudian edifice of psychoanalysis 
but reinterpreted Freud using the the paradigms of his day, which were uh, structural linguistics, um, anthropology, and mm. also you know literature, philosophy, and all the other sort of um, tools that he had at, at his disposal. But what he was primarily interested in, the most important thing was to try and look at the unconscious as structured like a language, so that you know the material psychoanalysis is language and nothing else. You know when when you're in an analysis. That's what is worked with. It's the language. And it's very much there which you will find the stories that people tell themselves. And within these stories, there are always patterns. There's always a structure that can be found to do with uh, the positioning of oneself in relation to an object. Well, it feels like language does have its function in regards to how we, I guess, identify artificial intelligence in being intelligent. And I'm thinking specifically of the Turing test. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we use language as the way in which we can understand something to be uh, artificially intelligent or human, humanly intelligent. I mean, in what way is language so important for helping us to navigate these new territories? Well, it's fundamental. I mean, for, for psychoanalysis, you know, language is actually the definition of subjectivity. You know, language is the entrance into the symbolic. And for psychoanalysis, the, the speaking being, the speaking subject is a being who is trapped in language, who suffers from language. And it's through language mm. that our, our whole subjectivity is determined, how our sexuality is determined, our, you know, whether we identify ourselves as masculine or feminine is through language. And and I don't mm. mean on, in the banal sense of whether you call yourself a man or a woman, I mean really the structure of your language, of your discourse is one which determines your mode of enjoyment. And this is a sort of fundamental idea in psychoanalysis is this idea of modes of enjoyment, of how language itself how discourse becomes a mode of being in the world so that the whole edifice of, in a sense, abstract thought, of language, of philosophy is built on this mode of enjoyment, is built on the possibility of, the, you know, the first said something that signified hmm. something that then led to the creation of language is really where the whole the whole messy thing of being a human starts and the whole question of speculative thought drops out and you have this new question of what it means to be a, a living being. And, and that's really a question that isn't often understood by, for example, evolutionary biology, to, to mm. people who tend to think that humans are just part of nature, which they, they really aren't. That's a fascinating assertion. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fascinating. Oh, you just you just drop that in the end. Just no, human in beings end. aren't really part of nature. Uh, it's like you can't do that. I was going to ask you about language, but uh, uh, I mean. That's a tricky statement because then, then the question is, then artificial intelligence, I mean, is it from nature by virtue of being created by human beings or is it completely artificial by, by virtue of being created by something that you consider not being of nature, the human? Well, when I say not of nature, you know, of course, evolutionarily, we're all from yeah. nature, we've all evolved. But the question of, you know, the denaturing of the human, of uh, not necessarily the human body, but the human, yeah. the idea of the human as a thinking thing is something which is only possible by virtue of symbolization, by virtue of the existence mm. of the of abstraction. And it's this yeah. abstraction that allows any form of postulating about the nature of the human and its place in, in nature itself. So it sort of becomes this MOBA strip of, you know, you cross over into, am I part of nature? Well, I can only be part of nature by... By taking myself outside of nature and asking myself that question. I mean, mm. you talked there about the idea of humans getting themselves to a certain point where they can then hand over the reins, as it were, to mm. superior forms of intelligence. And you, know, you, you remind me of James Lovelock and his idea of the Novocene, mm. which is his idea that now we've passed the Anthropocene and now we're in the Novocene, which is when the possibility of species that can think 10,000 times faster than humans and we need to like preserve the envi our environmental conditions to allow these forms of, of intelligence to survive. And then once they survive, we're kind of obsolete. Mm. So this is sort of quite like <laughs> parable of giving birth to the next form of thinking. And I think it's it's funny, and I I kind of I find it quite sweet. I'm not I'm not saying like I don't think that's possible, maybe, uh -huh. but it's it's interesting because it's such a fantastical and philosophical gamut you're making because you're basically really banking on this question of the possibility of abstraction, you know, mm. 
the idea that you can think about this supposed species that can think 10,000 times faster than a human, what does that mean to think 10,000 times faster? Computers think 10,000 times faster for some things, you know, but mm. for other things they can't because human intelligence and human consciousness is not like that. It's not like this one whole thing that you can place and say, this is a, a, a thinking being, you know, it's, it's made up of lots of different things. And actually when you kind of detach it from this idea of having to be within a body, then mm. you see that the, the question of thinking and consciousness is, is a lot more complex than that. In that case, it does feel like the direction of travel for the creation of artificial intelligence is really about taking something which is wonderful because it's fundamentally beyond language and finding ways to trap it inside of language. For us to make it intelligible to the human, we need to either trap it in a body or trap it in language. Mm -hmm. It needs to present in a way in which we will fundamentally understand it. Yeah. Uh, you know, We hear these ideas of the black box algorithm. It's like, what is that algorithm doing? No one really knows. Mm -hmm. It's beyond our, our human understanding. And it's beyond our human understanding because it's ones and zeros. It's beyond the language discourse that we use mm -hmm. to subjectively communicate with each other. Yeah. Exactly. And this kind of idea of the outside of, of, of intelligence, the outside of thinking or the sort of mystery unknown, it's, it's mm. part of science and it's, it's necessary for the generation of science, of true science. You know, for Lacan, he would say, you know, that the true hysteric discourse is a, is a discourse of science in the sense that mm. theoretical physics, for example, doesn't have the answer to everything. It's constantly looking for new questions and new ways of understanding the universe. There is no fully comprehensive way of understanding it. And, and that's often where scientific reductionists go wrong because they think that science is one day going to give them the answer to everything, which of course it, it's not. Hmm. You know, science, when it does its job, is never going to be satisfied because it's always looking for the outside and it's constantly voraciously chewing up new ideas and then throwing out old ones. So part of the, the, the sort of fear of AI is this positing of a form of intelligence that is beyond us or not only beyond us, but it's beyond us, but then it also wants to torture us or it wants to hurt us. And mm. it's all knowing, it's all omnipotent. And, you know, that's why I've been given the book with the, the Rocco's Basilisk example, mm. because I think this is a real fantasy that scares a lot of people in the world of AI. Well, for those who may not know, what is the Rocco's Basilisk? It was a thought experiment that appeared on a um, on Less Wrong Forum. Mm. And it, it basically, it was this idea that in a future world, there'd be a, an AI that could be infinitely intelligent. Because that is possible, this potential AI was possible to imagine, just the very thought of it would compel you to have to try and do everything in your power to bring it into existence. Because if you didn't, it meant that you were doing something against the greatest being that could be imagined. Hmm. And, it, and it sort of very much follows the sort of St. Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God, which is you know, what is the definition of God? It's that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Therefore, if mm. you can conceive of something greater than that, then you've conceived of God. And, you know, so this is self-fulfilling prophecy about what is God. And so it's also a bit, it's a bit like Pascal's wager as well. It's like, well, it's better to believe in it because if I don't believe in it, what if it comes and kills me? So the thing is, is that these people who were thinking about this idea of this terrible, all-powerful AI, well, you know, intelligent boys who knew a lot about Bayesian <laughs> theory and, and probability and were thinking very complex thoughts about how they might end up getting themselves into a serious shit if they didn't uh, do the right things and bring <laughs> Brocco's Basilisk into existence. And basically it became this like urban legend sort of thing that it had to be taken down because people were having psychological breakdowns because they thought that if they that once they thought it, they couldn't unthink it and this AI could come back and torture them for eternity. Mm. And so what I found really interesting about that, apart from the obvious sort of fantastical elements of it, was the paradox between, on the one hand, the idea of the sort of flesh and bones of the human, that is just this bag mm. of physical pain that could be tortured, but then also the question of infinite simulation, you know, so you're trapped between your body and also the, the possibility of never being able to die. Because if you can be tortured infinitely because you can't die. Your body's going mm. on and on and on. So this is a very human problem. And this is a problem of philosophy. You know, we've got these bodies that we can suffer in, but we also can imagine the, we can't imagine our own death. 
because we can't imagine our own death, it's very terrifying to think that our suffering may never end. And, and this, to me, kind of articulated a fundamental fantasy about the problem of AI, the fears of AI. Listening to you there, it makes me realise that we have to really be careful what we wish for because <laughs> it may just come true. And if we do project all these paranoid fears associated with AI onto the development of this sort of technology, are we in a tricky situation where we're going to end up basically generating the circumstances for this horrific future to occur anyway. The hyperstition that you talk about in the book, you know, yeah. if we wish it into existence, then it may actually happen on the proviso that we give those sorts of narratives enough libidimal power. Yeah. I think that at the moment, you know, so much power and influence is put into the hands of the wrong people. I mean, you know, Times person of the year, as we know, is going to be Elon Musk. And this is a person who is driving the narrative. And yes, he has resistance, but actually how much resistance can you have when you have that much money and that much power? Yeah. And the question is, what, what's important is to get, to get more thinking from more different disciplines around these questions. Because I think at the moment, the direction of travel is all skewed skewed towards, you know, the hard sciences, entrepreneurialism, um, expansionism, when actually we need thinking about the sort of very nuanced nitty gritty of what we're talking about here, which is humans. <laughs> and humans are very complicated things and very delicate things and very powerful things. And we need to understand them before we can understand how AI will interact with them. Now, I'm far from being an Elon Musk fanboy, but hearing you say the wrong person there, I mean, is it the wrong person? And by which I mean, he's a unique individual insofar is that he, he's able to play those games with the future whereby he can speak things into existence, even if they're purely fictional. We see that with the examples of how he can make proclamations about certain uh, clean futures mm -hmm. and that affects his stock market valuation for Tesla in the present and therefore opens the Overton window to create the future that he has envisioned at that present moment in time. Mm. Or simply with things like Bitcoin, he can make some form of proclamation on Twitter and, and affect markets in real time mm -hmm. and in the future. Having that power Mm -hmm. that mimetic power to be able to speak the future and then for it to occur in the way in which you envision. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly power. It is. Um, and it's a rare power. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a wrong thing. Well, yeah, I think billionaires are wrong, first of all. <laughs> yeah, all right. We can agree on that, but I'm saying the fundamental ability, I mean, you know, the circumstances through which the world creates billionaires is extremely exploitative, but I'm saying that the ability to uh, think futures mm. and by thinking and expressing those futures, generate the circumstances through which those futures also come to pass. I mean, that's a power we all need to really learn, isn't it? Well, yes, but that's the sort of the idea that we can all learn that is impossible because the question of the existence of billionaires and the question of a person like Elon Musk being able to exist and project these ideas into existence are actually inextricable and they're inextricably linked. And in fact, you could almost say that they're one in the same thing. And I would say that without billionaires, Elon Musk couldn't exist. And without capitalism, Elon Musk wouldn't exist. Yeah. He's a hugely talented person for what he does. And he's obviously very intelligent and does amazing things. But that doesn't mean to say that a person such as Elon Musk, which it could be Elon Musk, it could have been somebody else, you know, it's somebody with that profile, which is only made possible through the this enormous beast, which is capitalism. And this is very much part of the question of the accelerationist yeah. ideas, which is to what extent is accelerationism bringing about the conditions for human emancipation, for human greatness, mm. for human happiness, for, and let's not even say human, let's just say for great <laughs> things, you know, because yeah. at the moment it's not doing that. And it's patently obvious that it's not bringing about wonderful conditions for lots of human beings to thrive. And so the fantasy that that these little, small, I won't call them little, but these few men, and this small mm. group of men who have such power and influence, and they're the people who are literally able to create the discourse and set the tone, 
you know, that seems to me to be skewed. And, and when I say he's the wrong person, any one person would be the wrong person. Okay, that I can agree on. Although it does feel like, you know, it's only impossible because you say it's impossible. So you've got to be careful about those sorts of language games. It may be possible if you believe it to be so. Yeah, I think because you, because I think what, what you were saying was that he kind of is a good sort of role model for this type of entrepreneurial spirit. I guess I, I think that's what you were sort no, of saying. I disagree that he's a good, I disagree that he's a good role, role model, but I do find it fascinating that he has a rare ability to speak futures that then come to pass. But don't you think that that's hyperstition? I mean, I would say that's hyperstition. I mean, it is hyperstition. Yeah. It, it 100% is hyperstition. <laughs> I mean, he is accelerationism. Embodied. Acting through hyperstition. Yeah, I mean, he, he <laughs> I literally is. He is and it, it, doesn't that make it a fascinating character to, to study he, in that he respect? He is fascinating. Yeah. He is fascinating. There's no doubt about it. I mean, and like he's sort of almost like a, he's a parody of himself and everything that's happened yeah, yeah. that he's done. You know, you could say, "Wow, how did that happen?" But it's sort of it is a self fulfilling prophecy in a way because the conditions in which he has been sort of engineered as this figure. Or if anyone prophesied it, it was Nick Land, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, a controversial figure. But the idea of AI and capitalism being one in the same is very well exemplified by the figure and sort of life history of somebody like Elon Musk. And for good or ill, these are ideas that are very important to think about uh, in terms of the relationship between instrumentalization of thinking and of intelligence and all the infrastructure around the digital age and the creation of wealth and the creation of the billionaire as a figure. And I think that those ideas are, are ones which we should really examine and return to when we're thinking about who these people are, who are leading the future of what's going to happen in the next, you know, 10, 15, 20, if we last that long as a species. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and that's why, yeah, if we last that long as a species. I mean, and that's why we need to return to this idea of, uh, I guess, collective intelligences. The, the very fact that a multitude of individuals contribute uh, not to a singular notion of human intelligence, but to human culture itself. You know, we all have a contribution to human culture. And if anything is worth preserving, it is the human culture. It's not one individual brain. I think where Kurzweil's got things deeply, deeply wrong, mm. it's about my intelligence that should be preserved, mm. my brain, my being, mm. my singular desire to have me continue ad infinitum and throughout time. And as you reveal in the, in the book, I mean, that comes with some dangers, doesn't it? Because a lot of these longevity guys, they assume that, hey, if I get to, if I get to live forever, then I've overcome my suffering. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. It's, it's all over. I've, I've done what I needed to do. And if anything, as, as you say, it's, it's a prolonging of their suffering, especially for the sort of male proponents of longevity who actually find it very difficult to do things like have sex, procreate, mm. be with other human mm. beings. Mm. I mean, they're still going to have that challenge. And I've always found it fascinating that a lot of those those men who are arguing for longevity very rarely have partners or want to have children yeah. or have the ability to have children. It's, there's something deeply psychologically Definitely. tied in with some of these visions, which is what I love about your work, actually. Well, thank you. Well, you know, I think that's a really good point because, you know, the question of of melancholy and the question of really being able to see sort of psychoanalytic structures at work in the way that people relate to things such as uh, immortality, for example. And you're right, because having, you know, come across and, and seen stuff about those types of people who are interested in cryogenics, there's so much melancholy hmm. there. You know, there's people who are really suffering, who were trying to find a way of, of sort of holding on to something which they've clearly lost. And the idea that somehow being able to live forever would be something nice when, you know, you'd live and everybody, all the people who you love would, would be dead or, you know, in itself, it's a very strange idea. And, you know, we're back to just a classic philosophical problem of what, what is the being, you know, the being towards death as, as Heidegger would think of it. But of course, this is an idea that is very familiar for most people. You don't need to read Heidegger. It's the idea that, that death is something that conditions humans and that something that is very much part of how we project ourselves into the future. So the question of reproduction, mm. the question of children, the question of all of these ideas of what it means to persist as a human mm. makes a difference for when you're thinking about, well, what do I mean in, in, in this, the, the grand scheme of the world? Am I going to be remembered because I have a child and then another, and they'll have children? Or am I going to remember because I 
build a building or I write a book or I, I'm in a film, you know, and everyone probably has a different way of trying to find themselves etched onto the face of the earth and, and to claim the, the, them, themselves as actually really being here. But definitely, you know, immortality is another one of those difficult questions around AI that people think is going to solve all their problems, but it really is probably not. Yeah, well, well, the tricky thing is the I, you know, doesn't necessarily need to be the continuation of a singular individual's contribution. The thing that is worth preserving, or at least it feels like the thing that's worth preserving when, when you really drill down with a lot of these guys who are worried about existential risk is human culture itself. Mm. And sometimes the reason why they're arguing so heavily for artificial intelligence is they just see it as the container for human culture and it's an easier thing to get off planet than human beings are. Hey, if we want to preserve all of our knowledge in yeah. some way, shape or form, we've got to do it in a non-biological entity. Mm. Uh, this process of creating and preserving cultures by handing it to next generations, to next generations, to next generations of humans has a fault in it, which is this whole project could come to a halt mm -hmm. if there's something that affects the human biology of the entire species. Mm. Whereas if we can put all the knowledge that we've created throughout this, whatever we call it, the human project into yeah. something else and then get that off world, then at least, least it was worth something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least this whole human <laughs> suffering thing for, yeah. for a couple of hundreds of thousands of years, at least it was worth something. And I think that's what scares us so much. It's not our own individual yeah. death. It's the you know death of It's the idea that we'd just be gone. Collective knowledge yeah. in and, its entirety. But I mean this is sort of this is just just lost. But this is the very problem of like, you know, well, this was the beginning of art. It was it was somebody trying to blow some mm. ink onto a, onto a wall to show that they were there. You know, that was the first thing just to mark, uh, you know, how will anyone know in the future that I was here? And this is how it began, you know, to, to abstract yourself from mm. your, from your immediate temporal and spatial position. But, you know, of course, this is also a topic taken up by Benner Stiegler, Stiegler who, who recently died sadly, but he, his work was really interested in the question of techniques and the relationship of humans to the technical object and how the human evolved with with technology and this process of this sort of pharmacological process which was both poison and cure of how the sort of outsourcing mm. uh, the memo technical outsourcing of the human capacities to technological objects and how this process is is inevitably one which goes off into a sort of very exponential direction once the digital age hits because you know we've had sort of like gradual gradual movements for, for, through technical objects over history but that suddenly what happens is digitization happens and the outsourcing of capacities mm -hmm. that human beings are now dealing with are working on a, a sort of another whole scale and that becomes scary because this idea of this human that you're trying to preserve or this harmoniously kind of acting along with technology is now suddenly sort of cut off from it in some people's minds. It's like, oh, now suddenly we're a different type of human. We were this type of human, now we're a different type of human. Hmm. The question is if that's true or whether it's the question of it's just a sort of different form of abstraction into technology than we were previously uh, used to. So these are fascinating questions and we're only just beginning to really sort of come to grips with them, I think. Well, luckily, one of the ways we can investigate some of those questions is through the fictions that we create, science fictions, and they present themselves in a multitude of works that you mentioned in your book, from, from the work of Charlie Brooker to Alex Garland and Spike Johns. I mean, what is the importance of science fiction in allowing us to, I guess, prototype some of these visions for the future and then understand how they fundamentally make us feel as human beings? Well, I think sort of science fiction is almost the best way to to try and think about the future, and it's one of the most sort of potentially exciting and um, conceptually rich ways of imagining different forms of human and different ways that we can imagine our future with AI, for example. Film, for, for example, has always been a a brilliant medium for exploring these different questions and you know, one in a sense that's outside of the sort of textual uh, mediums because it doesn't always have to be in the written words that we're, we're thinking about these questions. And that's why I'm really interested in fi using film because film allows us to 
explore the different types of things at work when we're engaging with thinking about AI, i.e. not just thinking about the brain, but thinking about the body, thinking about the way that we interact uh, sexually with other beings and the way that we conceptualize of ourselves as bodied subjects who also have the capacity to separate ourselves off, off from our brain. So, you know, this fantasy of like mm. brains that you can remove from your body and then uh, put into another body, which is a sort of very sci-fi theme that we play around with. And in the book, I use different films to kind of go through different iterations of my questions. And as you know, the, the, the book uses Kant's three enlightenment questions. What can I know? What should I do? What can I hope for as sort of uh, frameworks for examining the question of the psychoanalysis, not psychoanalysis of AI, and which um, I use three films to explore these questions and sort of unpack in a, in a psychoanalytic way. The first question, what can I know, is, is really a, a sort of question of epistemology and the question of the foundation of knowledge, which I use the, the film Ex Machina as a sort of means to explore this question because it's the, the film which very beautifully enacts the Turing test, which is, of course, the test invented by Alan Turing in order to see if one could be fooled into thinking that an AI was human. And interestingly, the test actually invokes the question of gender and the question of whether one could tell what gender AI was, not by the, anything they actually particularly said, but just by the way the language was constructed. And at the time, this wasn't really picked up on, but I found it very interesting in relation to my question, because, of course, for psychoanalysis, the question of language is the fundamental question of whether one uh, identifies as a feminine or a masculine subject. And in this film, the human masculine subject talking to the feminine AI subject is really trying to discern her humanness, but actually what he's trying to discern is her femininity. Mm. She proves herself a woman to him. And by the end of it, he's in love with her because she has become a woman for him. And, hmm. you know, there's a very nice quote by uh, Jacqueline Miller, which is, to what lengths man will go to make woman exist? You know, so this idea of a mm. woman having to exist for man, the, the idea of a woman. And another, you know, thing that is a famous sort of, uh, a quote from Lacan, which is that the woman doesn't exist, which people have taken to mean lots of things over the years. But essentially, what he's saying is this idea of the woman is not a is not a real thing. It's a it's a construction of language that is necessitated by masculinity. So masculinity is a position that necessitates the existence of woman. So mm. the the epistemic question here in in that film is really nicely articulated by this the human need to make the AI, the, the feminine AI exist and come into existence via his interrogations of her. But well, the, the thing I find fascinating about the way in which you use science fiction is that it almost feels like we need to take a moment to psychoanalyze the creators of some of these uh, shows. I mean, we, we have a very visceral effect when we see some of the stories that they're, they're telling us, but it always turns out uh, of recent times, these new sorts of science fiction, they always end up in a situation whereby the AI in the image and likeness of us will either kill us, fuck us, or in the case of Ex Machina, will do both. So what is the reason for the drive towards these very popularist narratives around the either hypersexualization or the hyperviolence that will emerge from these forms of technologies? Well, I mean, the banal answer would be to say, oh, well, because they're men that create them. That's, I'm not going to say <laughs> that because that's too easy. But, you know, of course, these are masculine fantasies about the potential of a sort of infinitely fuckable woman. Mm. And in a sense, it's it's more interesting to think about, well, what's going on there that's not just about something we can easily put down as misogyny or sexism? Because actually, you know, this question of the unkillable body is a theme which runs through a lot of sci-fi and particularly in the form of female bodies as well. And one that I pick up in the, the chapter on um, what should I do which is the question of the ethics of psychoanalysis and one which I used the film um, Ghost in the Shell for. And I think what's interesting here is this um, idea of the sort of invincible woman, you know, this body that you can do anything to, but the subtext being that 
she, you can't kill her, but you can also keep fucking her and, and you know, she'll be fine. In the sort of Westworldian mm. idea of the sex bots that you can do horrible things to and they'll forget the next day. So this question of suffering and this question of being able to either like in actual fantasies upon something or someone and not have any redress is obviously a very human, horrible reality, which is there's no point in, in us pretending that it doesn't exist because it's everywhere. You know, th- these things are not just in fiction, they're real things. They're things that humans do to each other, especially male humans mm. to female humans, as we know. And, you know, the idea that it only exists in fiction is is ludicrous. So of course, it's going to be right there in the center of our fantasies of AI, because why do we, these fantasies of what we're cr- creating species that are essentially at our beck and call, they're just colonial fantasies, really. They're sort of patriarchal colonial fantasies. And that's why we're so scared of them, because people are always scared of subjugated pe- peoples. You know, people are scared of mm. groups of people who have traditionally been treated very badly. And it's obvious what I'm talking about. But this is no different from racism and misogyny. There is no difference from this form of like fear of something fighting back after you've had it at your mercy of course it's going to be theme that is going to veer its ugly head yeah definitely so so in that case is there a normative relationship that we should have with ai because in all of these sorts of fictions it ends up in a, a relationship that's either neurotic psychotic or in some way perverse is there a way we can uh, move towards a, a relationship with ai that doesn't amplify some of these negative aspects of human being, I guess. Well, it's interesting that you said it's either neurotic, psychotic or perverse, and can't we have just a a normal one? Well, for psychoanalysis, that's all there is. You know, you're either neurotic, (laughs) psychotic or perverse. And (laughs) and that's really, that's the only choices other than arguably um, the autistic subject, which is another controversial subject within psychoanalytic discourse of whether that's a feature of psychotic structure or something altogether different. But I digress. Mm. But the the point is, is that in psychoanalysis, you know, there is no normal subject. All you have is different modes of navigating the sort of Oedipal drama and making up for the fact that we are essentially all fucked and, you know, we're all mad in different ways. And the manifestation, the structure of your madness can either be neurotic, psychotic or perverse. So it's just different ways of navigating your relationship to signification. So the fact that you said, oh, can't we just have a normal way? Well, actually, the only normal way is via these methods. And and we have to understand what we're working with when we're talking about AI. So I think actually it's, it's very useful to think about the neurotic subject or the psychotic subject. And hence why a big part of the book is dedicated to the question of ordinary psychosis, which is a methodological shift within clinical psychoanalysis of a way of uh, looking at human suffering in a slightly different model than has previously been thought, i.e. instead of assuming that most people are are neurotic and there's going to be the odd psychotic, instead it's more like the psychotic is the the generalised state of most humans and actually it's less normal to have a neurotic subject nowadays than a psychotic subject. So that's a sort of another interesting way to try and approach how we are thinking about AI in this day and age, yeah. Well, in that case, is that realization that we're all in some way fucked? Is is that the thing that is driving our desire to create artificial versions of ourselves? Because baked into that possibility is the idea that we can actually fix all those problems that we have identified and now have to acknowledge. Mm-hmm. We, we don't want to pass on uh, those sorts of characteristics through, say, our genes, through traditional, let's call it traditional procreation. And the best way to uh, start over or do over is to just build something from scratch that doesn't have all of those tricky, fuzzy things built into it that is a hyper-rational being mm. that has kind of this very clear and clean understanding of how it wants to navigate the world, uh, rejecting all of those neurotic, psychotic and perverse things. And one of the reasonings to do that is to make them, in many ways, ideal workers, Mm -hmm. (laughs) if they're not worried about all those things that they they can exist within that framework. And the other way to do that, as they used to do with slaves, castrate them, uh, make them non-sexual beings, these these future robots. That's 
true, but here's the problem, because no matter if you castrate someone, they're still sexual. You know, mm. the organ is not what makes the sexual being. Of course, yeah. What I was trying to say is that <laughs> to correspond with uh, neurosis, psychosis and perversion, we can say neurosis is repression, perversion is disavowal yeah. and psychosis is foreclosure. And those terms are the central terms in psychoanalysis to d- denote in what mode you have dealt with the name of the father, right? The name of the father being the incursion of the primary signifier in your early Oedipal mm. development. So this kind of way that you uh, have kind of initiated yourself into language for when we say repression, you know, that's, this is the normal neurotic way of being in the world and um, repressing the name of the father, but foreclosure, this scary idea of not even having this signifier even in your purview at all means that you are basically lost in language and at any moment your whole symbolizing framework can can fall apart and it's only held together by some sort of compensatory mechanism, which is something which, if it's lost, can bring on a psychotic episode, for example, right? So this is the classic Mm. idea of of psychosis. And then, of course, for the pervert, disavowal is that, you know, yes, I know that there is such a thing as the name of the father, but I'm not going to acknowledge it, which for psychoanalysis, people always say, well, perverts never come to the clinic because they're very happy with their symptom, right? And so right. when you say a pervert, and people typically think of, oh, pervert as people who have have weird sexual activities. Well, everybody has weird sexual activities, but the point is a pervert is somebody who particularly perhaps maybe in the sort of stereotype of it is somebody who has a fetish, for example, a fetish for a particular mm. object. And the way, the reason why this is a sort of form of disavowal is it's because this particular object, say, for example, a stiletto shoe stands in as this sort of compensatory object that is hiding this nothingness that is uh, very scary and consuming, but it has become a way to survive for the pervert, right? So point being is that everybody has their way of being in the world and for the neurotic, you know, these can take the form of obsession for some people and particular routines that they need to do or for or sort of hysterical questioning of one's position of whether you're a man or a woman, for example, is another very neurotic symptom. But essentially, these are all just humans. We all do some form of these things. And the, the autistic subject is a very interesting subject because actually there are people who are currently looking at the ways in which autistic subjects are being very much honed in on and recruited for like Silicon Valley. Because mm. often autistic people are people who are very good with numbers, who are very good with processing large amounts of information, but not people necessarily who are very good at human um, interaction. And they're people who just want to get on with a job and they're very hardworking. So they're perfect kind of subjects for capitalism. <laughs> mm. Well, let's not forget that uh, Elon Musk also recently uh, came out as being on the autistic spectrum. Mm. So maybe there is something in in that as being the, the future model of, of what of how humanity could present itself. But very quickly, you mentioned there are these different fetishes that people have. I mean, that becomes the issue with sex robots, whether they're a compensation object, whether they're compensating for relations with um, the human beings, mm. or whether they in of themselves are the fetish, whether what the individual wants from a sex robot is the very fact that it's a robot, mm-hmm. that it is not a human, that is the thing that they want it for, because that fundamentally changes the debate. It's it's cyber sex expert Trudy Barber who's been quite clear that in actual fact people want sometimes to have relations with these dolls and with these objects. It's mm. not about using these dolls and objects as compensation for real humans. No, exactly. And I don't think they are compensation for humans. I think the idea of having a, a sexual object, a sort of a fetish object, in the form of a sort of perfunctory silicone thing is kind of quite basic way of interacting in a masculine way with the female body, which is not that much different from how porn works anyway. So I wouldn't say that it's like this massive difference and this massive change, but Mm. there are so many questions surrounding what's happening with the sorts of people who are interested in sex robots and all of the politics around it and all of the questions that intersect with, for example, sex work and with the politics of sex work, which again is not my area and there's lots of people doing much more on that specific question. It is interesting to think about like, well, what is it that you want when you want to have sex with something that you know is an inanimate object? Because 
it's not it can't be that you're pretending that they're real of course of course mm. you're not you know so th- there's something about this undead creature and and again that's something that I find interesting and to think about and is in the book of the question of the undead the question of the undead female body which I think is particularly mm. interesting for men this question of of what it means to what happens after you die and to be horrible and gruesome about it as we know you know the the history of serial killers shows us that men are often very fascinated by this question of the dead body of the dead woman of what what it means and what mm. you can do with it in much more than women you know I'm, I'm sure women have have done terrible horrible things as well but there is obviously something about men and women's bodies that concerns them that they're interested in and this is a deeply psychoanalytic question it's not just a question of the sex robot industry it's a question of male and female sexuality fundamentally. Ultimately, are you actually saying that the way in which we are striving to understand each other now isn't by studying each other through something like psychoanalysis, it's by building versions of each other. It used to be that, you know, to understand humans, you would study humans, but now it feels like our ability to fully understand humans is predicated on our ability to recreate the human in the form of artificial intelligence at at that AI level. And as you mentioned right at the beginning of the show, this kind of weird uh, dichotomy of trying to understand artificial intelligence by using the model of the human brain versus using the model of the human brain to understand artificial intelligence. There's there's all of this kind of desire to understand who we are mm. that is occurring through this process of, not procreation, but process of creation. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because I think that, you know, there's always this theme running through literature on, on AI as well about you know, who are the new gods? You know, are are we creating Mm. AI or is AI going to be the thing that is actually ultimately creative and then that that itself creates something new? And I think that this idea of recursion is, again, central to the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of thinking Mm. about consciousness of how do you think about extracting yourself from the process of thinking about human beings and to be a, a dispassionate observer and to be able to make models of the mind, you know, this whole idea of neuroscience of being able to model the brain and then, you know, like the, the blue brain project of like making accurate enough models of what's going mm-hmm. on in the brain. And then eventually you'll, you'll have a human brain. But of course, by that time, God knows what, you know, the idea that that would, would, would be tantamount to creating a human subject, which it couldn't possibly be yeah. because we've already got these things and they're up there doing all their shit. And yet, you know, what's interesting about humans is that we all have potentially this software. We all potentially could think and be and do all these things, but actually most of us don't and most of us can't. Mm. But why? Because, well, it's much more to do with what opportunities you're given, what society allows you to do, how human beings are fostered and the question really, what sh- we should be thinking about when we're, we're worried about the future of human thought and human intelligence is how to make the conditions for as many human beings as possible to do wonderful things with their brains, to be able to really thrive mm. from the capacities of the human mind and the human brain and, and create as many, you know, this whole nonsense about, oh, um, let a thousand Beethovens, or is it Mozart's, who said that, but Be- Be- Bezos or something, mm. bloom. And it's like, well, Yes, but actually they're all over the place. And the reason why they're not thriving and not blooming is because people are poor and people are in horrible situations and people are exploited and they have to go and do shit jobs in offices. And yet get AI to do the shit jobs and let humans become Mozart. Perhaps that would be what we should aim for. I don't know. That's it. That's the fundamental joke in the the work is... What it feels like is that we're moving towards a society where it's valuable not to create AI, but just to get humans to act robotically. Mm. You know, there's a move towards human behavior becoming more mechanical. We've mistaken the machinic metaphor through which we understand human biology and the human brain for the actual. It's what's driving all of these narratives and what we're ending up with is a human being that only feels normal if it is able to express itself in very binary ways. Mm. And partly that's because of the environment in which it is living and digital mediated environment in which the human being is living, but also the way in which society sees that as 
and nasciently valuable, whether it's if you don't think creatively and you just do the job at hand, you're an ideal worker, mm -hmm. or if you do have some sort of neurosis or psychosis, then we will provide you with the drugs to reset you towards a baseline. Mm -hmm. We will treat you like a machine. Mm -hmm. And it feels like that's what we've created, a society whereby artificial entities or, or entities that are thinking in artificial ways are already here mm. and they just happen to be human beings. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that what what's happening is, you're quite right, is that humans are just becoming more programmable and mm. we create the conditions for making human beings the model of the AI. And because there is no space for humans to think for themselves. There's no yep. conditions for them to thrive in that way creatively. And all the ways that we're supposed to be creative, that we're told by neoliberalism, be creative, are ways to be creative, mm -hmm. to make money. You know, obviously yep. never to make money for yourself, to make money for a corporation or to make, or, and if you do mm. make money for yourself, it's because you're, you've become a, the perfect neoliberal subject and that's, and you've, you've monetized yourself. But you know, there the really doesn't exist the conditions for people to just think and to think outside of all of these strictures of the algorithm. Well, in that case, how do we create the conditions to level up the human or increase the resilience of the human as opposed to allowing them to slip towards a more machinic way of being? How do we use the tools that you've mentioned in, in this podcast? How, would you, how do we use tools like hyperstition to mm. rewrite new narratives for what it means to be human in the 21st century? And, and do you believe, Isabel, that it's even possible? Well, it's a very big, important question and, you know, sort of massive political question, isn't it? And mm. I don't think that it's just merely a question of big, bold thinkers coming and telling people what to do. I think it's a question of infrastructures and things like the universities need to have proper humanities departments that are funded, <laughs> that allow people mm. to go and study philosophy, for example. It's basically impossible nowadays for people to uh, study PhDs without uh, having a job. You know, for example, mm. uh, it's impossible for people to become academics without also working in other industries, without having to pimp themselves out to every p person who comes along because you can't just make a living out of writing and thinking, which is something that you, you, you know, you could do. People in the past, mm. the great thinkers and great artists and everything, they had, okay, maybe it's, it's not good to be romantic, but the idea that these people could live and, and thrive was because... They could have a roof over their head. They could have a place to work. They could have a place to think. They could, you know, have have decent quality of life. And that's becoming less and less possible. And the people that are afforded those opportunities are rich people or people who are the odd person who's able to find some sort of slither out of it. But this is very few and far between. And I would say the only hope, the only hope for human beings mm. is pe giving people the space to be creative and think. And you know, also to put a premium on how important it is to uh, slow down thinking, to come off social media yep. and to not be constantly looking at the next thing and actually to read books, you know, because you can't do thinking mm -hmm. without reading books. And that, that's the, just the bottom line. If, and the thing about social media, it makes you so anxious that it's very difficult to find the time to concentrate and slow your mind down enough to just follow a thought. And I think that's one of the main problems as well coming in for this next generation coming up is they're not going to be able to do that because they don't have the the concentration span you know we're constantly mm. bombarded with symbols all the time and i think that's very anxiety provoking there's a little part of me that wants to be hopeful for that next generation the, the wonderful thing about the failure of the predicted a levels here in the uk mm. was that it started a small campaign amongst that next generation called fuck the algorithm <laughs> when they felt like they were so disenfranchised by the way in which the uk government assigned them their a level degrees based on predicted results mm. that were decided by an algorithm so i mean little little kernels of hope like that mm. give give me hope but i i genuinely I, I just, it pains me to believe that the accelerationists with all of their nihilism are right. And yet what we see is that artificial persons already exist mm. and they, they aren't in the form of artificial intelligences in the form of androids and robots. Mm -hmm. They're 
in the form of corporations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and they're causing a great deal of harm to other humans and to the planet. And if we are unable to find tools to mitigate the negative effects of artificial persons, i.e. corporations, then it feels like we're never going to find the tools to mitigate the negative effects for any coming form of artificial intelligences. Absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, capitalism, the bottom line, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it always comes down to it. And the thing is, is that whilst that dictates our behaviour, uh, it's very difficult to see out of it. And it's very difficult to see how we're going to be able to have the time and space to think past this, you know, horrible impasse. And as you say, you know, we're just sort of creating these artificially stupid people, mm. <laughs> not even artificially intelligent, but we're just going through the motions and thinking that distraction to people to throw out the fantasy of the scary robot coming in and taking over would actually, the scary robots are already here. And, you know, the people you need to be really scared of are the humans and they're already doing pretty bad shit. Yeah. And, but it's not also being scared of the humans, it's being empathetic to the humans by understanding through a process of psychoanalysis why human beings are sometimes a little fucked up, <laughs> we might be able to forgive ourselves. Yes, quite. Well, we're all mad. We're all fucked up. That's certainly true. There is no such thing as a healthy, happy human. All we have is ways of dealing with that fucked upness. And, and you know, obviously in my dictatorship, I would enforce psychoanalysis for everybody. And, and you know, that would be the way forward uh -huh. to more functional, happy, harmonious life. <laughs> Well, on, on, on that highly challenging note, I Isabel Miller, I just want to, I guess I want to thank you uh, for being on the Futures podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to Isabel for revealing the relationship between psychoanalysis and artificial intelligence. You can find out more by purchasing her new book, The Psychoanalysis of Artificial Intelligence, available now. If you like what you've heard, then you can subscribe for our latest episode. Or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Futures Podcast. More episodes, transcripts, and show notes can be found at futurespodcast.net. Thank you for listening to the Futures Podcast. <laughs>